Well, 45 was my birth year. I remember it well. <laughs> I'll never forget that day. And John, that was a long time ago. A long time ago. The uh, title of the message tonight is Musing by the Fire. Musing by the Fire. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 39. Brother Lawson spends a lot of time in the Psalms. And uh, if you go look at the archive, you'll see message after message preached, gleaned. And uh, it's one of God's special books to his people to encourage us along. And we get to read about the things that are going on in the lives of great men and women. And then the Spirit of God takes them from kings and prophets and speaks to our hearts. Psalm 39, verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. We've well, given himself some good advice, hasn't he? I was dumb with silence. I held my peace, even from good. And my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to be in church. Thank you for your precious word. Now may the Holy Spirit of God do with it that which needs to be done in the hearts and lives of the people. Thank you for the privilege of being able to stand once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Yesterday was a beautiful day, and Linda and I spent a lot of time out in the backyard around the fire pit. We were picking up sticks and burning and, and things and uh, sitting in the lawn chair looking at that fire. And uh, I began to muse. I did some musing. I, I'm really not sure whether I did it right or not, but I began to think some deep thoughts. And this passage of scripture about David came to my heart. And the Lord said, I want you to put a message together. I'll tell you what. And then you come preach it. So that's, that's where we are. Musing. You have to understand a little bit about the circumstances. David now is... Body worn out, frail, enemies on every hand, betrayed by his own family. And uh, he is reckoned and dealt with a lot of things. And uh, here he begins his complaint to the Lord. He decided, I'm just going to shut my mouth. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Did I tell you here a while back? He that speaks by the yard and thinks by the inch should be kicked by the foot. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. And uh, there are times to be quiet, uh, particularly when you're praying. There's a, there's a place for public prayer. Church is a place. But there are some things that you pray about. You ought to shut your mouth when you pray. So, well, how will God hear me? Depends on where he is. If he's in glory three heavens away, that's a long way up. But if he's on the throne room of your heart, you don't have to talk. Amen. Amen. And a lot of times when we begin to pour out our, our failures, our problems to men, it's almost like the devil is saying, slow down, motor mouth, I can't keep up. You know? Uh, the devil's not omnipotent. He's not, um, he's not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. He, the only things he knows about me are the things I've blurted out. 
And so we need to be circumspect and careful in some of the things that we say. And one of the things that we need to mark in our mind, once it's spoken, a word can never be recalled. You see them sometimes, they go out and they do their dirty work. James said the tongue set on fire of hell. So the tongue is what David is dealing with here. And he, he begins his complaint with the Lord. He said, I dried up. I didn't say anything to anybody about anything. I didn't want to give the wicked a way to, to accuse me. And I even went so far as I didn't even say anything good. And David's heart was right. But he carried that just a little bit too far, didn't he? We do that sometimes, don't we? Carry things a little too far. Go a little further than we ought to. Remember who this is. This is a man that had the highest highs, the greatest victories, and the most spectacular failures. This was David and Goliath. And the same one and the same man is David and Bathsheba. Problems. The reason I know, one of the reasons I know the Bible is God's very word is, there's a lot of this I wouldn't put in the Bible if I was writing about myself. Amen? No, there's a lot about me you don't want to know. And uh, I've spent my life as a repudiation of what I used to be. But David is here now and he's exhausted he doesn't know if he's, came, if he's coming to the end of his life. He doesn't know if he's, the sickness is unto death for him. He doesn't know where he stands. You and I sometimes can deal with things like that when you're speaking to the Lord about your circumstances and all. And sometimes it's good for us to, to think. Uh, if you sit in front of a fire pit and you can watch that fire and the first thing that comes to your mind is I'm hot, you're not a very deep thinker. Huh? You, you're not a very deep thinker. I look at that flame go up and down. My, my mind takes me uh, all different kinds of places. I think about energy. I think about destruction. I think about uh, the privilege of being uh, sent through the fire to purify myself. Linda's uncle, Jack, was a jeweler. And I asked Uncle Jack one time, a great Anglican man, I said, Uncle Jack, what's pure gold? He said, we don't know. We can't get the fire hot enough to purify pure gold. But if we could, it would be like a looking glass. And that's what John saw in heaven, wasn't it? The streets of pure gold as transparent as glass. My, my, fire. God uses fire sometimes in our lives to burn off the dross. The old song says, the flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your soul in his excellent word. I love the old hymns. I love the old hymns. So here's David. And he's moved to a point where he just has, he cannot contain his thoughts any longer. And he begins to blurt out his complaint to the Lord and cry out, to the Lord. And the thing I think about David, he didn't do this to the people around the throne. He went straight to the one that could help. And by the way, when you're in trouble and you have to have help, go to God. And, and when you can't understand something, all you have to do is ask. The Bible said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. There's no reason for there to be a bunch of stupid Baptists. 
Amen. You've got God's word in front of you. We ought, to, we ought to read God's word in reading about this great man that I, I could, I pale thinking that I can compare myself in any way to him. But I have my own vice, just like he had his. You have your own difficulties and problems and cares. We wrestle with things, every one of us, all the time. We think nobody else is going through them, but everybody's, everybody's got their battles. But David finally comes to the place that he sits. Life has driven him to a serious reflection on his person. And it brought him to cry out to God. And I believe Psalm 39 is David's cry out, who am I and why am I here? And all God's people need to have a reflection with God on that. Who am I? And why am I here? So let's look a little bit at what he said. I, that, that word musing, I looked it up. I can't pronounce the Hebrew. Uh, Dr. Lawson can. I can't. But it means to ponder, to murmur. I like this, to mutter, muttering. You ever mutter to yourself? To meditate. So as I read that, I began to ponder. And this is where David is. He's begun to ponder on these great things of life. They, 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 far more than just the temporal problems you've faced, but about where we stand with the Lord and where we stand in our life. And if you're ever going to deal with these things in your life like that, you have to start with an honest self-evaluation. That's what David did. He confessed to the Lord. I said, I'll take heed to my ways. I sin not with my tongue. I'll keep my mouth with a bridle, a muzzle, while the wicked's before me. I was dumb with silence. I couldn't talk. I couldn't say anything. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned and he, he couldn't hold back. Jeremiah the prophet preached for 42 years in Israel. As far as we know, there was not one convert. Think of that. As far as we know. He finally cried out and he said, I, I'm not going to speak anymore in his name. I just want to build me a little place for wayfaring men to go and to keep an end for them. And Jeremiah said, but his word was in me like a burning fire and I could not stay. Sometimes it comes to the place that we have to look at ourselves with an honest, honest self-evaluation. Conviction that comes from the heart. When the Spirit of God so deals with us in our lives and I, and I don't know how we come to church here and not be brought to the place continuously where we say Lord where do I stand what am I doing what about life what is it going to be but his heart was moved to conviction and the Bible said the fire burned that is he had a personal reckoning with himself when you, when you come to the place that you have a personal reckoning with yourself, then it's no longer your wife's fault. It's no longer your children's fault. It's no longer the pastor's fault. It's no longer the president's fault. It's no longer the man on the street's fault. The things you're wrestling with, many, all of my wounds so far have been self-inflicted. All self-inflicted. But he said the fire burned. He, he, uh, he, he, came to look at himself. One of the things I thought about the fire yesterday is that fire can either warm or burn depending on where you stand. And uh, people sometimes get cold on God and they quit reading their Bible and they quit praying and the first thing you know they're out of church and, I, I, and, and when you're cold in your heart that's the last thing you ought to do. You ought to get in church, get yourself in your Bible, start reading the Word of God, and talk with God, have communion with Him. Amen? Amen. So he looked in, 
And then he looked to God and he began to ask. He said, Lord, verse 4, make me to know mine end. Now I'll tell you, life short. I never thought I'd be standing nearly 78 years old preaching. Brother, Brother Lawson called me last week and said, uh, you still preaching? I said, I think I'm going to probably do with the pulpit. What you do, we'll be carried out, tow up. <laughs> Amen. But as long, long as the Lord gives me strength, uh, what was Billy Ke Kelly said, I, I'm going to gnaw on the devil till I lose all my teeth and then I'm going to gum him to death. <laughs> Look over at Psalm 90. Life's short. In verse number 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten. I've already done that and more. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow for is soon cut off and we fly away. Life is, life is short. What, what David is confessing here is that life is precious. Life is, is precious. And he knows this. He knows time is running out if all things go according to nature to him, at some point he's just going to run out and the Lord's going to call him home. Did you know this? Think of this. The Lord knows when you're going to die. Boy, yeah, sure he does. The Lord knows when I'm going to die. Yeah, he knows everything. I've come to the place I don't know anything anymore. I used to know everything. I don't know anything. But I know God does. And God has numbered our days. And the days are counting. And uh, to all the joggers, I had someone to say sometime, do you jog? I do, getting up. <laughs> I, I, do, I, do, I do. But what I figured out is, if the Lord knows my days, and I have a certain number of heartbeats to last me through my life, why am I going to speed them up and run them before I'm done? <laughs> Dr. Seitler told his son one time, he's, he said, uh, uh, James said to him, he said, Dad, you need, to start, you need to start playing golf. And he said, uh, he said I said to him, when am I going to play, play golf? I preach every day of the week. And he said, well, then you ought to start jogging. And uh, Dr. Silas said, bodily exercise profiteth little. <laughs> Both great men of God. But you know, life is short. And we need to remember that it is. And death is a certainty for all of us. Hebrews 9.21, and it's appointed unto man how many times? How many times to die? You mean you're not going to come back as a cow or a cockroach or a prince or a, or a queen? It's amazing to me that people who believe in reincarnation, back in another life they were always a princess or a very wealthy person. I've never heard one yet come back and, uh, and say, well, back when I was somebody else, I was just a no good bum. I never heard that. One life. We'll soon be past, and only what's done for Christ will last. And so death is going to claim us. It's appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment one time. And we all have that appointment. And then the Lord said, and then David cried out, and help me to know the measure of my days. He's not saying, tell me when I'm going to die. Wouldn't that be awful? To know, listen, Hezekiah lived one of the most miserable 15 years of his entire existence because he knew when. I don't want to know when. I, I, just, I want that in the hands of God. And, and uh, I've had people ask about, about uh, suicide and the things that are attendant to that. And, uh, and I've always responded. 
I'd hate to go into the presence of a holy God without an invitation. I mean, I want to go when he calls me. And that'll be good enough for me. He's not saying, when am I going to die or how am I going to die? What he's asking God here is, what will it... Now look at my life, Lord, look at me. What will it all add up to? What, what's it going to add up to? And uh, I began to think about that and I, I asked myself some questions. And by the way, one of the first questions that a person who proposes to be a born-again child of God, you better be able to answer two important questions. Number one, do you know your sins are forgiven? And number two, are you going to heaven when you die? If you can't say yes to those two, nothing else in life matters. Be sure that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and that you've opened your heart and invited him to come in and to be your Lord and Savior. I, you know, I, I have over the course of time, I've heard a few parents say, I'm not going to force religion on my child. I'm, I'm always shocked when somebody says that. And my response has always been, you mean you're going to give them hell as an option? That's what you're saying. Did it be okay with you if, if your child dies in his sins and goes to hell because you didn't care to take him to church? Well, both parent and child are lost. That's what the problem is there. And then another question I ask myself is, am I acquitting myself properly to God? Am I acquitting myself properly to God? My life verse is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so I speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Oh God, the cry from the bosom of every blood-washed, born-again child of God is whatever I do, let every bit of it redound to the glory of Christ and the glory of God. Let my life count for him. Uh, here a while back, I, it was Brother Harding or, or Pastor One that spoke about stewardship. stewardship. A steward is someone who manages the property of another. What? You mean I'm not my own man? Oh, no. Not if you're saved by the grace of God, Brother Tom. No. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you're not your own? You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I belong to him. My greatest and highest responsibility in my life in everything I do is to see that it's pleasing to him. Amen. The fact that uh, someone could dare to think I'm saved and uh, the primary function of your heart not be to bring glory to him or to reflect upon him. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so I ask the Lord, help me to be a good steward of what you've given me. You know what the stewardship, you know the, what he does to every child of God. The Holy Ghost imparts certain spiritual gifts to help you help the body of Christ with all. And he gives them to every man. Say, what's my spiritual gift? I don't know. I can see some. I see some people have a gift of helps. That's very evident to a lot of people. And then there's a the gift of pastor and teacher. When I was a youngster, it killed me to think I had to stand up in English class and give a 10-minute report. And now I can't say my name in 10 minutes. So that's one of the gifts. How am I acquitting myself to God? Your talent? If you have talent, are you using it for the Lord? Listen, 
We have wonderful musicians in this church. I come to church and I listen, and the music is so wonderful. By the way, David wrote this, and he gave it to uh, one of the three choir masters of, of the temple. Do you know they had 4,000 Levites to serve in that temple? Three, three great choirs, a center choir, choir and then one on either side. But he says here at the start of this, to the chief musician, even to Jude, Juthan, to Juduthan, sorry brother, Juduthan, he was one of the choir masters. And uh, David picked him out particularly because this was the psalm that David knew he could get it around and pick the right musicians and people for it. And so it was to go to, to the, this choir master and he would spread it about the temple and the people would sing it. You don't hear much singing of the psalms now, but it's beautiful when you do it. My talents... Am I wasting what God gave me? Or am I quitting myself before the master? And, uh, and then you always must ask this question. Am I making a difference in the lives of others? Is my life having an impact on the lives of my family, my children? Do our neighbors know that we're Christians? I want my neighbors to see me get in the car with the Bible Sunday morning. Amen. None of my children call me on Sunday morning or Sunday night. Why? Because we're in church. Not one of our children ever ask us, are we going to church today? Have they? Not one. What are we doing for the Lord? Are we giving it to him is our life affecting the lives of others? How are we? For some, folk need to quit talking and start praying. And then he says that I may know how frail I am. Back to, back to Psalm 90 again, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Number our days. What he's saying is, Lord, help me to attend to my time wisely. Help me attend. Uh, you, you. I don't need near as much relaxation and recreation as I think I do. It's better for me to be busy. If, if I'm sitting around, I'm going to break something or something's going to fail. Amen. Amen? I need to be busy. We need to be busy. And in the Lord's work, you need to be busy for the Lord. Do his thing. And, and our prayer ought to be, Lord, help me to attend to my time wisely. Someone once said, wasting time is not murder. A uh, killing time is not murder. It's suicide. Killing time is not murder. It's suicide. To number our days. He's not saying, Father, I want you to tell me how many more days I've got. Because I'm going to get my calendar down and I'm going to start marking X's through the days till I run out of time. I would hate to live like that. I don't want to live that way. But he's, he's crying out to make my time count. When you get finished, what are they going to put on your tombstone? Well, he was lazy and he never did anything for God. I stood up in West Virginia at the uh, gravestone of Robert Sheffy, that wonderful old Methodist circuit riding preacher. And it said the same thing that Fanny Crosby's tombstone says. Here lies Robert Sheffy. 
He hath done what he could. Did you know they pulled that man out of a saddle, frozen in the saddle? Going to preach to folk to win souls, to go. We have it so easy. We have, there's so much abundance and idleness all around us all the time. God help us not to ever be grudging with our time for the Lord, but yield it to him to be used so that we might be blessed by him. Now, I want to read you something I read. I thought it was when I was musing. I thought this was good. Time is not measured by eternity. Eternity cannot be known by time. Time may only be measured by life. Your life is precious. The past is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. And uh, in closing, it would be wise for us to remember the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the last two verses. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, I don't know how the Lord speaks to you and, and deals with you and nudges you. I've tried my best to be tenderhearted so that he doesn't have to yell or take a switch. Our children are all different. My son, I had to wear him out constantly. But one of our daughters, all I had to do was say, <clears throat> and she'd break down in tears. We're all different, every one of us. But our duty and purpose is to fear God and to realize that one day after a while, he's been kind to me. I thank the Lord that he's not had to beat me that I'm aware of. And I've been allowed to serve him. But one day after a while, I'm going to stand before him. Say, that'll be a wonderful day. I don't know. Ask John, Bab ask John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos after he got back and then called up into the third heaven. He said, I heard him behind me. I turned around and looked at him and dropped dead. So he said, what he said? That's East Tennessee. I fell at his feet as dead. So that's going to be something when we stand before him. And there's a lot of baggage. A lot of things I hear preachers sometimes get in the pulpit and they talk about what they used to do. I don't ever do that. Don't ever need to do that. I, my children don't need to know that. Amen. And the people that love you, they don't, they, don't, they don't need to hear that. Just put it in the past. And thank God that we do have a past. And I couldn't get to my past, but God did. And he, what was it in the house where the uninvited guest came in and bathed our master's feet with her tears? And he said to his host, you didn't extend even the slightest common courtesy to me. Come in. You, you brought me here to mock. But this girl's been on her face and she's poured her heart out. And the Lord said in his parable to him, he frankly forgave. You know what that means? He went back in the past. And he washed it all away. Amen. And he cleansed it. And we don't have to dwell on that anymore. Amen. Let us look to the future. Let us look to the tomorrows. 
that are yet ahead. And while we can, let us do what we can for the good Lord. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being in church tonight. I thank you for the privilege of preaching and uh, for being in this pulpit. Now, God, do with it every heart as you know best. Help us, Lord, that we spend a little bit of time. Some folk might need to do some honest self-evaluation. Help us to do it. And then bless in the altar calling for what you do. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.